Hello, everyone, and welcome um, for our uh, final keynote before our closing plenary this afternoon. Um, we're really excited. I hope everyone had enough lunch and uh, is well set for the afternoon ahead. Uh, we have um, uh, the closing keynote and then uh, a panel a set of panel sessions. And the reason I'm here actually is because I really very much wanted to invite you and encourage you to come back for our last session with the Youth Media Education Summit. Over the course of the last couple of days, I've been learning very much about how excited and uh, productive the uh, folks have been in that program. And they're very eager to share the stories, the uh, journalistic accounts that they've developed. So um, this is all by way of uh, hook, line, and sinker to try to encourage you to come back uh, at 545. Uh, and then we'll have a closing plenary with uh, Lisa Soap and Antonio Lopez. And Please be aware, Antonio has prepared a version of the Tetrad game based on the summit for us. So we're going to be both engaged and challenged by this, which will be fantastic. And then um, we have the closing remarks from Julian McDougall, which uh, I, I really want to encourage you to come. Julian's been such a force in driving this conference forward and making this uh, weekend uh, possible. So, And that'll bring us to a close from a, a very productive few days together. Having said all that, it's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage, stage David Nosbakken, who's going to introduce Mark's sermon, our final keto. David. I think you were going to mention everybody should hand in their uh, oh. <laughs> hand in their uh, name lanyards. tags, right? Please leave your lanyards at the front registration when we uh, when you leave. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are. That seems to be uh, uh, an opening statement now. I think it's a COVID or post-COVID phenomenon that we think of ourselves being in all the world at the same time. Uh, Zoom has helped us in that respect. And uh, so we're well connected, and it's much more possible to be in real discussions with people all over the world and to collaborate in ways we maybe hadn't thought of uh, before COVID. Uh, our speaker today knows this whole world very, very well. Mark Sherman is the director of Mozilla Foundation, a global community that does everything from making Firefox uh, to taking stands on issues like privacy and net neutrality. For more than two decades, Mark has uh, stood up for open sources and putting technology in the hands of everyday people. Mark was the founding director of telecenter.org, a $26 million initiative connecting community technology centers in more than 30 countries. <clears throat> he ran the Commons Group for 10 years, a boutique consulting firm that provided advice and insight on networks, technology, and social enterprise to nonprofits and governments around the world. Mark was awarded the prestigious Shuttleworth Foundation Fellowship, where he explored how to apply open source approaches to philanthropy um, years before he was at the uh, Mozilla Foundation. <clears throat> Mark is a prominent thinker and thought leader. His analysis and opinions have been featured in the Washington Post, NPR, CNN, Fast Company, dozens of publications. Mark has delivered keynotes in five continents at major global events, as diverse as Mobile World Congress, Personal Democracy Forum, TEDx Kids, World Information Summit on Education, and the O'Reilly Open Source Summit. He's a past board member of Peer to Peer University, the World Bank Solution for Youth Employment Consortium, the Toronto Arts Foundation, a Connected Learning Alliance. Telefonica is big, I think big, uh, the Association for Progressive Communication, Wild Canada and Rabble CA. And full disclosure, uh, he has been serving on the advisory committee for the McLuhan Foundation for the last two years and has recently joined the board of directors of the foundation. Uh, and Mark is uh, one of the good guys. Uh, he's generous, accessible, engaged. He thinks big, but his feet are firmly planted on the ground. So it's my pleasure to bring to you our friend and colleague, 
uh, the man in the red tennis shoes, Mr. Mark Sermon. Amen. Okay. A lot of things that they said I did. Um, hello, thank you for having me here. Uh, it is just a, a pleasure to be a, a part of this. Um, I was really excited when David and Carolyn had invited me. Um, and and they sort of asked me, we talked a little bit about what should I cover? Uh, and I'm like, is it changing? No. Oops. There we go. Uh, and, and what I decided to talk about many, many months ago before the current news hype cycle is media literacy in the age of AI. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and two reasons. One, I really think that in my whole career, maybe even you know, before I had a career, media literacy and questions around how we understand and shape media have been central to everything I do. And so I feel at home very much in the McLuhan Foundation uh, and in this group. Uh, and then the last five years of my work and Mozilla's work has really been around the question of trustworthy AI. And as we build technology and the internet into everything we do, how do we trust it? How do we shape it? How do we have a balance of power between all of us who are uh, connected into it. So that's what I wanted to play with today. Um, as probably all of you know, because you all give talks, um, you know, I don't know, that was three or four or five or six months ago that I said that was what I was going to talk about. And then, you know, 10 days ago, I'm like, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> um, and so I was I was lucky that my partner, Cindy, who's, who's here with me, said, you know, there's a 30th anniversary screening of Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent. Uh, and so we went, I didn't think about this talk, but it actually like helped me figure out, you know, why am I doing this talk? Cause I kind of been doing this work for around 30 years. Um, in fact, Leslie and I were just talking about how we worked together in 1993. So that is in fact, exactly 30 years. And so that kind of got me thinking if you, if you haven't seen that movie recently, or if you haven't seen it, um, it's incredibly painful to watch. Uh, but also was really delightful because it brought back a lot of the things that I was really in the center of, of working on in the early 90s. Um, so, you know, I kind of McLuhan started, or not McLuhan, Chomsky started bouncing around in my head uh, for a few days. And that sort of gave me the structure of this talk. And, and really, uh, one of the quotes that stuck with me as I started going back and reading my old notes and stuff on the internet is this quote. Uh, the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion and then to allow a very lively debate within that spectrum. And of course, you know, that, that's kind of classic Chomsky. He's, the, you know, the, the, the anarchist who's very much talking about power. And of course, you know, he's a linguist first, but, but spent the later part of his career being much better known as an activist uh, and, and a thinker and not just about media, certainly about US foreign policy and, and all of the you know, questions of what we do and don't talk about in terms of how, you know, how power works in the world. Um, but of course, you know, Chomsky also wrote a lot about and talked a lot about uh, that the media is about power, that media in democracies uh, gets used as it, what he talks about propaganda being uh, the, the to a democracy, what a bludgeon is to a dictator. And so it's very much, you know, I'm sure most people are familiar with, with Chomsky, but sort of how uh, he framed things. And, and the, that's not the surprising part, of course, those are the things we know about Chomsky. What, what was really interesting in going back and watching that movie is like how much of a media literacy guy, even if he wouldn't have used that language, he really was. Because when you get him reflecting on why, like, why did he do the work that he did? It really was grounded in that more people could just question that frame. So, you know, if we exist in that frame where there can be lively debate between the left and the right, between liberals and conservatives, uh, but it's hard to bounce out of that frame, so much of why Chomsky wanted us to understand media is so we could be better actors in this world who could question that frame and look beyond it if we wanted, think about what is going on inside of it. And to me, that is really like the essence of why I have been interested in media literacy 
and questions around media and power for uh, for 30 years. Because I think if we want to have agency in shaping the world, we have to be able to have all the tools needed to question that frame and to speak outside it, to speak around the, what the, the edges are, to break it apart. Um, so that's really, if I think about myself as a media literacy practitioner, in a sense, uh, that that questioning of the frame is really quite a central piece that that I've thought about for the whole uh, time that I've been working on these issues. And just to give you my non-academic kind of view, like how do I think about media literacy? And I, I'm giving you this because it, it helped me go back and say, what is media literacy in the era of AI? It's like, okay, what have I thought about for uh, the last 30 years I've worked on? Um, and for me, it is both about text and context. And, and that's not, again, probably a very fancy or, or new idea in this audience, but just to ground how I see it, text being obviously what we read or see or hear, as well as the, the frame that it's inside. So a New York Times article, I think of the New York Times a lot because that's what Chomsky often pulled apart. A New York Times article, as well as the, the page or the issue, as well as the container, that is the New York Times or the container that is an article is how I think about text. Uh, and then context being the broader system, the, what's going on politically, who are the elites, what's the ownership structure of media, how does the overall system of, of media work? And to me, I've always wanted to play with both of those things and think that people need to be able to engage with and analyze both of those things. That's to me, the essence of good media literacy. And the other piece that I have always worked on from the very beginning before I even had any language about this is the idea that if we want people to be engaged or be able to engage with the world around us critically about media, it can't just be about critical review and consumption, which you know maybe is, is a weird thing to say now because we live in a much more read-write culture, but certainly growing up in a television era, the idea that media literacy also has to be about creating media was maybe a, a, a you know 30 years ago a bigger deal to say that but I, I don't think you can do good media literacy without there both being a, a critical reading as well as a production uh, component of it so that's sort of the lens that I went back to this question about uh, how do we take this media literacy is power idea and apply it to AI and before I get into that, I just want to like apply it a couple times in places that have been a part of my work, partly just so you get to know me a little bit more, but partly just so you, so you see how I, I think as I'm trying to poke at this question that I don't really have a, an answer to, even though I, I think about it all the time. And so, you know, the, the first place that I think about having had a media literacy practice was as a teenager, uh, as, a, as a punk kid. And, and, and it might giggle, but I mean, really is, if you think about the, the question of read-write culture, I mean, punk was a very important moment in terms of saying we can all produce media. And if I think about British punk anyways, arguably, well, almost certainly punk emerges in New York before it does in England, but let me just pretend it emerges in 1977 in, in London. Uh, some of the context of it, uh, as a global movement and phenomena, um, or sorry, the text of it is, you know, music, lyrics, a, a form of music that is very much countercultural and trying to critique the text of the mainstream music industry by, you know, being loud, by being simplistic, by being unprofessional, and certainly is questioning authority, whether that's authority in the music industry or authority in politics uh, at a lyrical level as well as all the things that spin off from punk because I never had a, I never had an instrument, but I was one of those like photo, photocopy montage zine kind of people. And so the same DIY aesthetics as a critical media practice spread out from music into everything around punk culture. And so to me, that's when I think about text, it's like playing with those things. And then of course the context is a very centralized big, entertainment industry that has emerged by the time of the of the 70s. We think about the 50s to the 70s and what the record industry emerges uh, in that the rock and roll record industry becomes in that period, how inaccessible it feels if you want to be a musician. Uh, we're in the, you know, the era of stadium rock and disco. And certainly in England, you're in the era of Thatcher. And that's the political context in which the lyrics come up. So that's when I kind of think about 
say punk as a media literacy practice, it's about playing with those things. Understanding or using the lyrics, the form, uh, as well as understanding what we're reacting to, critiquing those boundaries, which are, you know, commercial music, mainstream politics in that era, conservative politics. So, you know, that probably was the, people often actually ask me, how did I get my job? And the answer is almost invariably punk rock and the peace movement. Um, and it was actually being a punk rock kid and being able to speak politically through kind of DIY techniques that really set me on a path to what, I, what I've done my whole career. And where I spent my early paid career was in television. And this may be a little bit less iconic of an image and you might not be able to read the bottom, um, but what it says is it's the paper television guide to media activism. Um, and Paper Tiger was a public access TV collective in Manhattan in the Lower East Side um, in the early 90s. And that was the time where I was also a public access TV uh, producer, training activists to pick up cameras, make their own documentaries, all of those things. And that era, that particular stream of public access TV, which kind of was a little Chomskyan in its uh, style at the time, was very much at the textual level, uh, trying to deconstruct the text of the mainstream media. And in fact, one of the things, and one of the reasons I put this in here, the paper Tiger was well known for is they would have Noam Chomsky come on and he would just sit in a studio and deconstruct the New York Times. And so like the half an hour called Noam Chomsky reads the New York Times. He just picks up an issue of the New York Times and he says, oh, look at how many column inches are here about Cambodia. Look at how many column inches are here, not here about East Timor and all the things that Chomsky would say, but in a kind of a, a chatty kind of way. And so that whole stream of what I think of as a really interesting period in media literacy through activist video wasn't only public access television in the early 90s. Um, that's the text of it. And, you know, one of the nice and interesting things about activist practice and media literacy practice in this case is <clears throat> practice is a thing that prepares you for something. And one of the things that was really at that moment in my career was the Gulf War and the first George Bush and really the first CNN war, uh, the war that that kind of defined CNN as a, as a type of coverage. And that practice of deconstructing and playing with uh, mainstream television really was, um, was helpful as that war started because there was a real thriving of that kind of community of people, including stuff that I, I did, taking footage out of CNN, recycling it, deconstructing it, kept coming with a critique not only of the war, and it was connected to the peace movement at the time, but also deconstructing and critiquing the media and how the media covered the war and, and certainly um, made it hard to critique it, created that frame where debate was, was really not allowed outside of the edges. And it was very difficult at that time uh, to critique the war in, in any effective way, especially in America. Um, so that was a kind of second era where I played with media literacy and was defining in me. And then a third, this one seems a little cheerier, um, and it is, and probably not known by anyone in this room, but there was a period early when I was at Mozilla and it came out in a bunch of the things David just said, where really what uh, we, I was gonna try to take on, we did take on this question of, as the web was getting sort of vacuumed into Facebook and, and the growing kind of closed platforms, how do we make sure that read writability of the web is something that stays in the culture? Uh, it was a part of a broader uh, kind of thing out of a Riley group on, on kind of the maker movement and a lot of physical and digital creation. And really what we did was uh, around the world, help people organize workshops where they learn to deconstruct um, and play with and, and recode uh, aspects of the web. And so, the, the text there was the text of the web and then the ability to remix it. One of the core kind of little tools we had was something called x-ray goggles, where you could go in and see what made up a web page, click on it, you know, change a headline in the New York Times, change a headline on CNN, and just see like this is actually the materiality of the thing and it needn't be as it is presented. And, and we 
should all have agency in reshaping it. And that was the message. Um, and very much in the context of both, uh, as I say, the emergence of corporate platforms like Facebook um, and, and also the context of, of the Obama administration, which is an interesting setting because you don't think of it as necessarily the most constrained time in, in US political narrative, but it is exactly in the way that Chomsky says. Um, and it was very much probably a place where we, we lost and why we stopped doing this um, that whole narrative around picking up and grabbing technology um, got connected into a STEM agenda around really, you know, math and science being more central in uh, in schooling. And the idea we were trying to push creativity just got edged out of a lot of that. And that was kind of where we, we kind of got stuck uh, in that world. So, you know, those are three examples what by what I mean, media literacy is about power and, and certainly this idea that read write culture for me is at the core of good media literacy practice. So the, the question then that I asked myself for this talk is what is media literacy in the in the age of AI? And I, I hadn't stepped back and asked that of myself, even though, as I say, I, I've really been working on this question of trustworthy AI for the last um, the last four or five years. And so I kind of broke it down for myself. I'm just kind of taking you through my notes and hopefully it's it's interesting as I kind of ask this question. Um, so I think the, the first thing I did was go say, well, what? how do I think about what's the text? What are we looking at as we try to understand what's happening with AI and machine learning in our society? And what I kind of brought myself back to is how do I actually, or how have I and people around me been reading the evolution of reading the text uh, of the digital world in the last 15 or, or 20 years. Um, and actually it's gonna be 30 years or 28 years, I think in this next slide. So here is, I think my first website, certainly my first personal uh, website. And you can see at the time uh, that I was working on uh, transportation issues, internet culture uh, and information highway policy. Um, which Leslie is, that's when we were working together in 1993. But it's interesting. I mean, we were having a lot of the same policy debates then of who controls this. Uh, and, you know, I think there's been moments where we've won and, and a lot more moments where we've lost. But to, to leave that aside, as a web page, what's interesting in, in reading and going back and thinking that there are 30 year old web pages. This, this is a time where a web page is a, an expression of a, a person or an organization, maybe a big company, um, but it tended to be a lot of personal publishing. You would get there by typing the address. Like, I don't know the last time I typed in the full address of a, of a web page, but like that was how you would go and find this thing is it would have a name and it would have a domain attached to it and you would type it and you would go there. And it, and so, and it would often sit on a fairly independent web server or if it was a company that was hosting it or a university often, the companies tended to be small. And so, you know, and of course, the other way you found things and, and the revolution at the moment, which is easy to forget, uh, was hypertext. Um, and so you could move around by clicking on things. And that is also how through serendipity and curation, but individual serendipity and curation, uh, you know, we moved around and discovered things. And that, you know, I would say in that era, I was, despite <laughs> having tried to be critical on both sides of it, I, I had a, a my techno utopian moment in the sense it's like, look, we don't need the New York Times. We don't need Chomsky anymore. Like we can all make web pages and this is all going to be good, right? Like this corporate power structure, we just invented this thing. It's going to go right past it. Um, and so I, I think that was uh that was me in that moment um and it was a fairly independent thing and it, and it wasn't the curation very much was in the lens of, of what i created or you created or, or anyone created and how, how they connected to each other and you know then the evolution of it and thinking of well, how is the text evolving of course is the search engine and it's only a couple years after that site which i think was probably created in 94 i I found it in the Wayback Machine at 96, but that's, I think, as far back as the Wayback Machine goes. Um, Google incorporates in 1998, and it's around 2000 that, you know, I remember most people starting to switch to, to Google. And, and it's, I think, an important moment for a bunch of reasons. One, it 
you know, company that controls a lot of what happens in the world now. But it goes from typing a website or discover a URL or discovering things, um, you know, through serendipity and following links and curation of individuals to moving towards a, a very narrow set of central curators. And at least in the beginning, you know, Google is taking an approximation of all of that curation as, as the lens. And so that's important in reading the text of it in the page rank, which was the thing that made them better than, than all the other search engines was based on putting the stuff at the top that had the most things linking to it. So it was a very simple algorithm that curated what you saw because there was so much stuff to see. I mean, how did you ever find it with these kind of crappier search engines? Um, and so they put themselves in as the holder of the algorithm to curate what's most important, what's at the top of the list. And that's not inherently bad, but it's important to know that's what happened. Uh, and it is a big change from the idea of a lot of independent curators. There, there's independent curation and content inside of that, but we start to have a very specific and constrained and actually monocultural lens through which we discover content on the web quite early on in the in the evolution of the web. So I think in terms of reading the text of what builds towards AI, that's a really important moment and an important change in the form and the expression. Um, then, you know, that one of the next things that evolves is social media. And the reason we have Twitter here uh, is because it's the only social media I'm left on, which is both I'm happy about, but makes it hard to give a talk like this because uh, it's not the, the the weirdest or the worst of this moment. But what happens at this moment is I, I still have expression. In fact, more people have expression. More people have come online. More people are using Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I mean, the kind of things in, in many ways we'd hoped for in punk rock or, or public television, like we never could have imagined that so many people could speak. We never could imagine that so many people could get a video out to the world. And it was so easy. And so, I mean, that that's a shift uh, that certainly in many ways democratizes things more than the web even did. And it's simpler. You don't have to have a web server. You don't have to be able to code in HTML. But what also happens is we move from independent web servers discovered maybe through search to an increasingly narrow set of platforms that are controlled by a small set of players that constrain what the box of speech is. So, you know, I can only do 120 characters as a tweet unless later then you're a Twitter blue person and you can make it longer. Uh, or you can only post certain things to Facebook and it all appears much like a, a shopping mall. I mean, it's a kind of overused metaphor in the frame of that company branding and in the, you know, on that company's architecture and over time, uh, in its extractive ways in the data and the machine learning training that those companies do. So the, the text of the web is really changing to be moving from something very independent to something that is is on a fewer and fewer platforms in terms of where expression happens, uh, not exclusively, of course, you can still make a website, but the predominant uh, <coughs> platforms of expression are these. Um, and then over time, of course, uh, the curation of these is not just about that they own the real estate, um, but that what you see is optimized for their economic benefit. And if you think back to web pages or even Google search at the beginning when they didn't have ads and then they barely had ads, that curation is not driven by monetization yet. And of course, this just happens you know, as industries emerge is that they commercialize more deeply but uh, probably as everyone knows, this is sort of one of the big tipping points in terms of a, a driver of the mainstream use of machine learning and AI in all of our lives is the idea of serving up content to us that's interesting to us, but based really on engagement metrics of how long do we stay viewing the site? This is all the stuff that the social dilemma and many other things have talked about engagement metrics of how long do we stay on the site, which are really proxies for how many ads do we see. And so, you know, the world around us, if we see it through social media, which so many billions of people do, becomes curated and organized by the question of how long can I keep you looking at whatever content people create 
so that I can show you as many ads as possible. It's a very different text than you know the web page of, of 1994, um, and, and of course leads to all kinds of other stuff, which has been talked about at this conference and we've all been talking about for the last few years in, in terms of misinformation and manipulation and, and all of those kind of things. So it's important if we wanna to get to the question of what is media literacy in the age of AI to start to see how are these things accruing and changing over quite a short period of time and how do we understand them? And of course, because I'm not on TikTok, I had to get my son to send me a screen grab of a TikTok that I'm in. Um, I, I just, I can't, like it just, it it totally, if I'm on TikTok, the, the, like seven days of my life I've been on TikTok are completely lost. Um, so I, I, you know, that makes me very old. But of course we get at this point where I guess really Instagram being the first most significant example of this and, and TikTok uh, certainly is this, where we're not only on corporate platform is the way to easily express ourselves, but we're no longer on the web. So we're no longer on a thing we can link to. You can't, you kind of can link to an Instagram uh, post or, or a TikTok article, but unless you're a registered user, like on the platform, you can't get into it. I mean, it's not something that's accessible other than inside of the container uh, that, that is that app. Um, and of course, it's very, very optimized in terms of AI and funneling you into certain things to keep you engaged, to keep you never, uh, you know, not stopping using the app and see more ads, all of those kind of things. And so, the, you know, the text of it now, while it is creates funny and delightful and interesting and infuriating content, the text of it also is the, the funnel and the being in it and the constantly... Um, you know, constantly being drawn in. And, and that's true across most things that are consumer internet apps of that type, whether it's social media, dating apps, so on, is there, there's just like so much bombarding you to keep you using the app and not closing it, because that is what everybody is getting their bonus on in these companies. Revenue, and then revenue driven by engagement and, you know, sort of an addiction. So we, we got to get to the end of the text part, and this is what, you know, when I, without me putting a second prompt, what chat GPT said about me, um, I do not have a philosophy degree from the University of Toronto, and I never heard of a nonprofit uh, called Common Knowledge. But other than those two things, chat GPT did a good job. Um, and, and the thing about this, I mean, a couple of things about this and lots of other kinds of AI, I mean, yeah, there's so many different things. It's not just all chat GPT and Dolly, but I think what's important about this in the context of the evolution of our interaction with the digital information world, um, of course, is, you know, it, it's summative. And so if we go back to the idea of the web page or even search or even Twitter, like those have some personality and individuality in them. And with search being starting to be replaced by chatbots, or it looks like that is happening over the, you know, as the industry shakes up, we move to this summative spot where it is all of the history of the web that makes up that set of paragraphs. And certainly I can ask the prompt different things. The paragraph can get longer. I think I did give it a, a link so that it would show up on the slide. It can get shorter, I can get it to go this way, that way, change the style. But really, its job is to obfuscate where things came from and to completely control and curate the, the frame of, of knowledge where you know you, you don't see what it is and, and there's really not an alternative to how it might be expressed or a way to have two views side by side. So that's sort of where we have gotten, uh, or I think where we are now, having to ask some of these questions, it's not the only questions, around how do I read a world of AI and what is media literacy in this era? And I guess, I, I, I don't know the answer and I get the context in a second, but but why I go through this and where I'm sitting as, as we work a lot on what do we do with this stuff and what alternatives we create, it, is it is important, I think, especially if you're a practitioner who's working with people on media literacy, young people, anybody, that Understanding that requires understanding that it is an accretive technology and, and an accretive set of business models. And so it is from the web and further back, 
that this comes. And you need to understand, I think, all of the things in terms of how the materiality and the content of the web have emerged and exist, because this is just from an index of the web in the same way Google is, as well as the, the business models, questions around copyright, questions around uh, expression, all of the things that have been vacuumed into this and that then will define both our ability to understand it and our ability to control it and where companies take it. So I would say, at least as a starting point, I would say a, a media literacy of, of the AI era needs an understanding of that last couple of decades of how we have started to build the things that, that make a paragraph like this possible. And a, a paragraph like this is not possible because of something that happened overnight. I mean, OpenAI started in, I think, 2015. We've been working on this technology. It shows up in TikTok. It shows up in Twitter. It shows up in Facebook. It's just a moment where it's kind of snapping into something that catches our imag imagination. And it is an inflection point worth paying attention to, but it is also, I think if we wanna understand it and work with it and help people be critical about it, um, we need to understand how we've accrued to it. Um, so just the other side of it, if you think about that, as the, the background to read AI, or at least read consumer AI on the web and on smartphones and how it's getting deployed in consumer technology, because um, there's lots of other places to go read AI, is to think about the context. What's the political context? What's the system context? And, and what does that tell us and help us to understand about that frame that Chomsky talks about? And of course, the, the political context, um, I think has been in the background of, of this conference, certainly is local politics is actually not that important right now, although we still pay attention to it. We are in an era where climate, I think, is a very defining political moment. And that, that's a scary part. I will also say, you know, why I put Greta Thunberg up there is there also is a, a politics, certainly my kids' generation, that, that is not about thinking that formal politics have any of the, the answers to the political questions that, that we have. But that's an important thing to think about in what this moment is and then how reading media applies to it. Because I think a lot that will relate to what is contested between corporate media and, and media that is in the hands of people and how we think about what, what AI is. And then I guess the other part of it, this is impossible to read, um, kind of, I guess on purpose or kind of just because I don't have a big enough space, um, but this is a, a diagram that Kate Crawford and Vlad and Joller did as a, as a piece of art um, called Anatomy of an AI System. And basically, this is their anatomy of like what goes into an Alexa. Uh, and it's in the MoMA, and it kind of was created as an art piece. And when you actually see it as an art piece, it's like as big as this whole wall. And you know, look at the little pieces of it. It's a really impressive piece of work. But it, it is important when you think about an Alexa or a chat or chat GPT that it has roughly all of these components. So on this side, uh, it looks at all of the resource extraction and manufacturing that goes into the computing devices, whether it's a computing device you actually have in your home or the computing power that sits behind the AI, uh, including you know uh, all kinds of stuff that is very toxic and, and crappy to pull out of the earth is, is necessary for this stuff to work. And then uh, in the middle is all of like the, how the things we think about AI uh, function. So everything down from the, the core infrastructure of the internet to the collection of the data, to the training of the models, to the use of the models in the, in, let's say the Alexa in the voice interaction uh, and other things that Alexa does in terms of getting information and, and spitting it back to you. And then of course the, there is, if we think about this from a, a life cycle perspective, these things have a very short lifespan and there is all of the disposal phase, uh, whether that is the disposal of the servers that are quickly out of date uh, because they, you know, they don't have enough processing power or the devices themselves or the, the side waste from the, the resource extraction in the first place. It's important to really remember, I think, especially if we're thinking about critical media literacy, that that chat GPT summary that the Tesla driving by itself, that the YouTube video recommendation as context sit on all of that all the time. 
And it's very easy, even if you know about it, to forget that. But it is, if we want to be critical about what it is, a, a thing that, um, that we need to understand. There's lots of good stuff written on that, including Kate Crawford's Atlas of AI, which has its critics, but is a good summary of that whole um, that ecosystem. And then, of course, if you take that map and then think who runs those, you know, the, the ecosystem of those things, um, it includes some Chinese companies that might be beside this, but certainly in the context of the, the bulk of this in our lives, unless you use TikTok a lot, uh, it's five American companies that, that control most of it. And if, I think that's not shocking to anybody here, but it is really important if we want to think about how to arm ourselves to think critically about AI and, and the work that we're doing, how to maybe do something different uh, to understand the role that these companies play in shaping like how the how the system is evolving, how we might want to counter them and break it up and have things that are more independent. So probably if if you're kind of following the current AI hype cycle or the generative AI hype cycle, all the chat GPT, DALI stuff, you know, these companies are, you know, the, you're, you're hearing names of companies you haven't heard before, OpenAI, Stability, Anthropic, possibly. Uh, most of them have heavy investment from and run on the infrastructure of those five companies. And so uh, Anthropic is, is one that sort of has kind of, they, all these companies have like web pages that don't tell you what they do. So started as an AI research company about 18 months ago from some open AI spin-off people. Google is one of the major investors and it runs on, uh, on, on Google infrastructure. Stability, which is one is kind of become known because it's an open source, uh, has an open source tool called Stable Diffusion, as well as many other things that can run on your desktop and is like DALI, it's an image production piece. And because of its open source nature, which is very tricky for us to think about what you do about this, you can optimize it to do really horrific things. I mean, it, it, it's kind of crazy, but in any case, if you want to use stability in the cloud, you do it on AWS. Stability is trained on AWS. It's very much an Amazon property uh, in, in a lot of ways. And then, of course, the one that has gotten the most press, both as the AI and from a business perspective, is OpenAI, which has GPT-3 and ChatGPT and, and Dolly. And, and I knew, or many people know, Microsoft has been a major investor in it. If you go and look at... Um, at least how it's listed. And I can see the ways in which it, this is not exactly true, but it's 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 true enough. Look at Crunchbase, which breaks down venture capital deals and investments in, in the tech industry. The, um, OpenAI has received 11 billion and $120,000 uh, in outside capital, uh, 120,000 of which came from Y Combinator, the kind of incubator at the beginning, uh, and 11 billion of which has come from Microsoft. So, I mean, it's basically Microsoft. Um, and so as we see all this wave and it looks like there's a lot of startups, it, it is the same companies. And whether they're using that to try to shape their consumer products, which may or may not work if you try to use the Bing version of chat GPT, it is like unusable. It's like such good Microsoft example of Microsoft technology. Um, but regardless, if you want to use it in the cloud in an integrated way with other things you're doing, you have to use Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud platform. And so the idea that the relationships of these three things are about consolidation and cloud computing, which is actually where a lot of the money will get made in the short term on this. Most of that $11 billion is actually just a cloud computing budget for OpenAI. Uh, this is really about just further industry consolidation in shaping what the next era of this industry is going to look like. And of course, you know, it's not shocking to know that these are very big companies. Um, there they are ranked by 2022 revenue with Amazon at the at the 500 billion and, and tiny little meta at the 116 billion level. Um, and just if we're thinking about this in the context of media, it's worth you know, looking at some other things, um, the New York Times company is at 2.3 billion. And so certainly very tiny compared to all of these others who reminding ourselves going back to the text, these are the curators. These are the front pages of 
the world. So if we go back to Noam Chomsky, who was worried what was on the front page of the New York Times, like th this is it. And, and they're much bigger companies vertically integrated, integrated into our lives, curating how we see. And of course you can see out the side of the edges of it, but that's not what most of us and certainly not what most of most people do. So in, in reading the context, it's important to remember that. Um, a bit bigger than New York Times is Disney, which basically owns every media brand on the planet. And so every media brand on the planet is smaller than Facebook and a fifth or a sixth the size of Amazon because it owns Pixar, it owns mm -hmm. ABC, it owns you know so much stuff. So I mean, these are huge companies. Um, if you want to try to find a company that gets to this scale, so like what are what are those tech companies equivalent to in the economy? Um, you kind of have to go to that level. So Exxon starts to be bigger than most of them, smaller than Amazon at 413 billion. And then the last one is just a gratuitous fun, fun fact, but also important and scary uh, in terms of where this is going, especially when you go back to that anatomy of an AI diagram is this, if you randomly pick an airline, I happen to pick the biggest airline by revenue in the world, Delta, it's smaller, and I moved Facebook out because it's the smallest. Um, it's the it's smaller than than all of them by half, I guess, uh, of those ones, and, and still smaller than Facebook. And if you look at the carbon footprint of those two industries, we would think that the airline industry is bigger than the tech industry. But the internet is now surpassing, and you know it depends on whose numbers. It's surpassing by a little bit, uh, but there's other numbers that say it's surpassing by a lot. There are numbers that put the internet at four percent of global carbon emissions. And it is important in terms of reading machine learning and reading AI, because what AI is, I wouldn't say as much as Bitcoin, although one of the nice things about Bitcoin being such an egregious polluter is that there's been innovation in energy use in, in crypto, that the AI is a huge driver of increased energy use in running the internet. And so as we automate more, as we weave more, uh, more AI into everything, that number will just go up, uh, where hopefully the airline industry uh, one will, will go down. Um, so our decisions about this and how it works and these companies are, are certainly tied back to the biggest issue of our, our time, which is um, do we stay on this planet? Do we wreck it? All of, all of the ways you want to think about that. So I think in, in terms of media literacy in the age of AI, you know, I think you, you kind of have to sit with both of those things to, to answer the question, what is it or how do you want to engage with it personally in your work as, as researchers and your work as practitioners, um, where looking at the text as the accrued evolution of, of the text, the form, the, the kind of control structures, the curation structures of the last 25, 30 years of the web as well as really the ownership and the production structure in the context of something where, you know, corporate concentration and greed is certainly driving the climate crisis. And those big companies that are sort of positioned themselves as apolitical over the last 25, 30 years in Silicon Valley are a part of that system. And they're a part of that system in terms of how we understand the world. They're a part of the system in terms of the frame of what's possible. And they're part of that system in terms of the climate crisis itself. So if we want to understand them, I think we need to, to kind of keep poking at those two lenses um, at the same time. Which is, you know, kind of takes us back that, to the media literacy is kind of about the same thing it's always been about, is having the tools to understand what's happening in power, whether that power is what we can see, or that power is what can happen, or that power is who are the elites. Um, and I think a practice of looking at media literacy in the context of AI really goes back to that fundamental for me, um, which if you've been doing this for 30 years can be kind of, uh, can kind of take away hope. Although the reason I keep doing it is because I think we can chip away at the edges of it. Some of what Mozilla does, which is another talk. Um, and, and it, you know, I also happily discovered this quote again from, from Chomsky, which is that, you know, optimism is a strategy for making a better future because unless you believe the future can be better, you're unlikely to step up for it and take responsibility for making it so. And, and I just, I really believe that also has to be a part of our practice. There has to be a way that this works differently. I believe 
certainly that's what attracted me into Mozilla that beat Microsoft once before. It's interesting they're back on the stage again. Um, I don't know whether we can be lucky enough or the community around us can can kind of tip at some of that again, but I, I think we have to try. Uh, and certainly, you know, that's what inspires me in the climate movement and certainly in the young people in my life is that they, they have this dial. They know that this is what it's about. Uh, and, you know, there, there's a lot of, of good politics and opportunity in, in that. So that's my reflection over the last week. Uh, thank you for letting me come and share it. Five minutes or so. Yeah, Tori, I talked so long. I, it didn't wasn't the plan, but it happens. It's five minutes. Uh, so please, come on. I don't fight, but you also don't need to have questions. And maybe just let me know who you are. Thank you for being the first question asker. Hi, Mark. My name is Renee Hobbs at the University of Rhode Island's Media Education Lab. Having lived through that experience that you just described, it looked like we signed up for Twitter like the same month. Yeah. <laughs> There's a weird way that tracing the shifts in technology through your lifespan creates a sense of inevitability. This is the way it rolled. I wonder if you were to look back on the last 30 years, if you see any moments, woulda, coulda, shoulda moments, that looking back on 30 years were opportunities because you ended it with a very good point about where's the hope. And yes, we all put our, our hope in young people. But I also think there's a lot of value to looking back on our lived experience with history and finding moments when, if only X, Y, or Z, things might have been different. What do you say to that? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I can say the moments where I think it felt like um, where it was different for a moment or where we did things that created openings. And, and I certainly, like my other piece, we, this is a big reflection Cindy and I talked about after coming out of the Chomsky movie, is not just about optimism, but accepting that activism is not about winning, right? Activism is about counterbalancing that the, I think humanity is always going to tend towards concentration of power. I mean, it's a reason I like Chomsky being an anarchist, and I tend that way myself, is that disaggregating power, chipping away at it, at least for me, is is actually a worthwhile um pursuit. And so I think there are moments we have done that. Certainly, well before I was at Mozilla, having Firefox beat Internet Explorer and, and take the web back from being sucked inside of Windows was a, a really powerful moment. Um, I would say on, on our side, and, and sorry to make it so Mozilla-like, but it is a, a case where many people could have done this, and, and we tried and failed, and other people tried and failed, was um, trying to keep some of what was good about the web and the smartphone ecosystem. And if we had been able to do that, I think maybe some of the centralization of data collection and power might have been chipped away at or played out differently or not as bad or whatever. So certainly like Apple and then later Google with iPhone and Android completely succeeded at what Microsoft was trying to do with Internet Explorer and what that was for people who weren't alive then or weren't in paying attention or involved in this stuff was really they changed how web pages work so you could really only use web pages with windows right you would get these kind of pop-up windows saying this web page doesn't run on or only runs on internet explorer was about sucking everything into their ecosystem and apple and google really did that with the smartphone so i think that's probably one place if we've been able to to build alternative, more open smartphone operating systems, which which we tried and spent many hundreds of millions of dollars on and failed, but so did Nokia and so did lots of other people. Um, I mean, I can probably think of others, but certainly it's, it's a good thing to think about that list and what we might have done. That's good question. Question. Eric West, how do you position education in the context? 
in the context of my day-to-day -day work or in the context of this or you know I, I think I there's a couple of things I would say as as a person who has a, a three-year BA from five different universities that I got over eight years I think of you know education as something that you, you you should be able to play with for your own you know to get what you want out of it and, and that means I think in the context of this that there's two two things one um education should be a part of the practice of of so many parts of our our lives and um you know I, I I don't see it as just in the classroom it's in libraries it's in being a parent it's in how kids talk to each other it's in how adults talk to each other so like to the, in that version of education, like a, a critical perspective and a dialogue around the world, it's central, like it's a way of being. And I think of that education and learning as a as a way of being. And um, at least in my kids, I, I mean, I see them as, as smarter than anybody about it in terms of being critical about what's happening with, with, with the kind of stuff I talk about. But I do, that isn't to say I don't see a role for the academy or the, the, the kind of formal education system. There, of course there is. So bringing these practices into anything that is formal education in terms of being critical about the, the media environment around us, whether you're in communications or media studies or whether you're in political science or, or frankly, whether you're in physics it is important. I see this as a critical lens to all education and also all research and at, at all levels. Um, so I guess I mean, maybe that's a crappy answer to say I see it as a part of it, all education um, or it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you.